Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Martin Redmayne here again for the second of the Camper Nicholson's webinar series, CNI in Candid Conversation. Um, I'm going to try and make sure this is a, a step into a brave new world in terms of where the market of new build is going. Uh, we have a very interesting group of people on stage, uh, this virtual stage, talking about shipyards after the crisis. What I'm really trying to make sure we discuss are things like the um, force majeure con contract, uh, the, the clause that is sitting there that people will keep referring to, um, how to negotiate and collaborate with shipyards. We're going to talk about things that really are positive outcomes rather than just being, oh, the doom and gloom of what we are facing today. Um, there's some unlocking happening across the world. There's some positive stories coming out of the world. So we have to make sure this market stays strong, stays positive. And I feel my panel today will really sort of give you some rare insights, some positive out outlooks, and more importantly, some good advice. And I think that's really what the ultimate objective is of these webinars, is to give advice and give positive energy and make you feel confident about the future. So I bring in my panel one by one and uh, introduce them and allow them to share with you their personal views, personal perspectives, and more importantly, what they think is going to happen in the next sort of six months to a year. Uh, I think you'll find this very interesting. So stand by for my first um, panelist, which will be Fabio Ometto, the Chief Commercial Officer of Camper Nicholson International. Uh, Fabio, are you joining me now? Yes. yes. I'm Martin. Good afternoon, Martin. Fabio. How are you? I'm very good. Very good. And you? I'm well, thank you. I'm well. Um, give me a bit of background, Fabio, to, to what you're seeing at the moment. Well, uh, obviously, um, we had a, a kind of uh, uh, pause in the last uh, couple of weeks regarding the new build activity. And I'm talking about the projects going on and even nego negotiation. Uh, but uh, are we, in my opinion, uh, um, the most of the projects, uh, they are just suffering of a delay. Uh, obviously, the one yeah. under construction. But even uh, the conversation with clients interested in a new build, uh, it's uh, it's uh, suffering uh, uh, just a delay. Uh, we haven't experienced any any stop uh, in general. Uh, as you know, regarding the new build activities, uh, we had the North European shipyard still continuing uh, their activity. So our project there are moving forward, even if uh, uh, at a lower speed, I would say. While uh, the other uh, uh, major uh, nation building boats, Italy was a little bit more impacted by this, uh, this situation. So the shipyard had been closed for almost two months. Since two days, they could reopen again, and we are in daily contact with them. Uh, generally, I can uh, put forward the enthusiasm and the positivity of shipyards to come back, to continue their work, even if there will be restrictions and limitations, but uh, uh, just uh, not to do, uh, keep complaining or blaming the situation. Uh, but uh, continuing being convinced that, uh, you know, there will be owner building a boat. There are owners that actually wants to finish and build uh, the construction. So I feel like a kind of positive energy in the last couple of days. Good, good, good. I'm going to bring now Mark Cavendish in, our, our second panelist. Uh, just one second. Hello. Hi, Mark. Mark, how are you? Fabio. Very good, thanks. Yourself? How's sunny Shropshire? Sunny Shropshire is particularly delightful. It'd be quite nice to be doing this outside rather than inside. Well, one day soon, one day soon. <laughs> thanks. So, Heeson Shipyard, a long way from Shropshire, in, in the lovely part of Oss in Holland. What's happening there at the moment? Well, I mean, at risk of sounding it, um, excessively exuberant, which I shouldn't do, um, Heeson is faring uh, pretty well under the circumstances. Um, we took some quite drastic actions very early on in the process um, and uh, extended our working shifts, uh, doubled them to two shifts and halved the number of people. So we immediately re reduced the amount of contact. We installed yeah. uh, similar processes in the canteen, the works canteen, similar processes in the entrance and exit procedures to the shipyard. So we immediately uh, reduced the um, uh, social distancing uh, areas. And then, of course, along with everybody else, all the office-bound people like myself have been uh, sent home. 
Um, the result of that is that uh, we have not um, suffered any delays yet. Uh, and I, I say that with some significance yet. Um, we managed to keep the schedules um, correctly running for all the boats that we're building that are sold. So those boats that actually have an owner are all um, unaltered. Uh, we have done a couple of uh, moving around of the schedules for some of the boats we're building speculatively, um, particularly for next summer. Uh, but we haven't. Uh, but, but all the boats will be delivered uh, for next summer in time. So the the impact so far is not uh, is not um, affecting the owners. Good. Right. I'm going to bring my final panelist, uh, Jay Tucker, partner of Halbon Fenwick Wheel. Uh, Jay, I'm going to turn myself off first and bring you back in. So. Jay, please join us. And you're hearing me in the background talking anyway. Good afternoon. Hi, Jay. Yeah, how are you? Not too bad, thanks. The sunshine here. Good, good, good. Um, a lawyer's perspective is always interesting. What's happening in your world? What's coming across your desk uh, at home or virtually these days? Well, what crosses my desk is really all I can talk about. But it's been surprisingly active. I think um, I was expecting the, the flow of work to stop completely but it hasn't happily we're all working from home obviously but that's not such a difficult thing for us to do we really only put words on a page we don't have to build anything real um, yeah. and it's surprising I think the attitude of people <clears throat> is that this is bad while it happens but it will come to an end and so people are thinking a little bit more seriously about what they want to do but they're not giving up on it completely so contract negotiations are still ongoing even new inquiries are coming in from people who want to build something i think that's quite heartening uh, some of the discussions are a little bit strange uh, people don't know quite what to do about the force majeure clause in the contract when they come to it in negotiations and some people seem to think well this shouldn't apply to me um, just because the rest of the world is suffering from force majeure, that it needn't apply to me. But that kind of thing aside, there's this, a greater amount of activity than I was expecting when this first came to the fore. And that's heartening. Activity in terms of positive activity? Positive activity. People continuing negotiations that had already been started and people coming with new activity, people saying, I would like to start negotiations with the shipyard. And those new instructions are coming in for me. And I imagine good, other good. lawyers as well. It, 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 it can't just be me. Yeah, I think, that's fair. I think the lawyers I've spoken to have, have certainly given some echo to that sentiment, mm -hmm. which is all very good news. Yeah. Uh, so it's not, it's not as negative as people may have painted elsewhere. Um, I think, Mark, can I just bring you into the conversation as well? Um, Jay just mentioned the force majeure topic. Uh, when did that kick into action from a Heeson perspective out of interest? Uh, we sent out a notice um, uh, of a potential force majeure arising very, very early on in the process because you, you could see this was coming. Uh, yeah. And so we wanted to put our owners on notice that, that there was a situation arising that may well lead to a force majeure delay. And uh, fortunately, and I'm touching wood as I say this. So far, that's that's all. It's um, it's all all that's happened. Uh, we haven't had to take it uh, to another stage. And you know, with a bit of luck and God willing, maybe that will remain the case too. Yeah, yeah. I think that that begs the question, though: is we're being very optimistic and positive. What do you think are the ultimate negative impacts we're seeing at the moment, though? What what is what is really impacting the shipyards? in your opinion? Well, I mean, there's quite a lot of stress in maintaining the uh, production uh, so that there isn't any impact on our owners. Um, you know, people are very uh, discombobulated in the way things are happening. It's also very yeah. difficult, you know, working remotely. You know, the, the meetings and conversations take 10 times longer now than they used to. Um, and of course, there is a, there's a question of a supply chain at the moment that's holding up perfectly well. Uh, will, yeah. it, will it remain the case forever? I don't know. But, you know, you're looking at the signs around Europe and around uh, you know, Britain where we live. You know, there's a big pent-up uh, desire now to, to 
to move on as fast as we can. I mean, you know, now you're hearing talk about uh, opening up rather than lockdown. So, you know, the curve's flattened. Maybe there is a, a light at the end of the tunnel and maybe the tunnel isn't so long anymore. Mm, interesting. I'm just going to jump into a live question here. It's just coming from Moscow. Um, do you expect prices to increase at all for yachts um, because of various reasons like new EU rules or supply chains? Do you comment on the supply chain then, but any indication or any thought process there about pricing? No, no, no not as a result of um, coronavirus, not at the moment. Whether new EU legislation comes in or, or, or whatever is, yeah, I, can't, I can't tell you that. I haven't heard anything yet. Um, so I would say no, generally there shouldn't be. Fabio, any thoughts on the Italian market on that question? Well, I agree with Mark that uh, as a direct uh, result of the coronavirus, the, I don't think the prices will, uh, will increase. Uh, where the prices will be influenced is because uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, some, um, let's say, less solid shipyards will suffer of this situation. Uh, will uh, will be in trouble and they will be forced uh, in a way or another to in order to sell some project to offer uh, very good deals. But uh, I think this will be just very few cases and uh, it will not uh, impact in general the, the price level of, uh, of our market. And Jay, what do you think? Oh, Jay, you're on, you're on silent. There's not much lawyer can really say about prices, but um, the problem with this crisis is cash flow for the shipyard, not so much the cost of things. As soon as the situation gets back to normal, it'll be the same suppliers producing the same goods, same workers being paid the same wages. So I can't see that that's going to lead to a, a, a cost increase. But the problem, I think, as Fabio says, is cash flow for those shipyards that are suffering at the moment. Um, are they going to resolve that by charging higher prices in the future? I don't think that's, that's going to be the answer. I mean, the problem is right here and now. They're not able to complete stages. They're not able to uh, construction. They're not able to get paid cash when they need it. Um, I don't know how they solve that problem. Yeah, I think one interesting point I was going to raise, is it's just been raised by Julia as well as a question, is do you foresee that this crisis could bring forward, uh, well, what I term the bottom feeders or the uh, aggressive negotiators looking for good deals? Oh, yes. Really. Uh, what would you see? From a broker's perspective, have you seen the same thing? Or expect <clears throat> yes, that? yes, For definitely we expect that. And that's uh, a natural reaction to a, to a crisis uh, situation. But uh, if we look at the history, and if we look at, um, yeah, it, it has always happened in the past. What I think will happen is that uh, when the, the, the entire market will restart, the bottom feeder, let's say, what the so-called sharks, uh, will go around. and. Uh, we are already experiencing, you know, people ready to buy a boat with a 50% discount or whatever, they dream about it. But yeah. the, this um, the situation very soon uh, will uh, um, dissolve, will evaporate, because at the end of the day, uh, uh, it will be unlikely that shipyards will, uh, will uh, suddenly, because of these two months of slowdown or delay, will, uh, will sell for uh, such a major discount. There will be maybe one or two deals uh, on some specific boat, uh, defaulted boat, uh, on some specific situation. But I think that when you talk about spec boat and, uh, and, uh, and, and shipyards uh, with, a, with a vision, with a strategy and with a good uh, uh, order book, I don't see any reason why they should dramatically uh, uh, lower uh, uh, their prices. And again, normally this goes out, uh, this, uh, this, this dream about buying a 50% discount is dissolves in a couple of weeks or months after such a situation. Yeah. yeah. Shipyards can't sustain that kind of thing. I mean, if you sell a boat at a 50% discount, it hasn't cost you 50% to build. So uh, it's a suicidal policy if that's what happens. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. I, th I think it's one of those situations whereby we've seen it in the past with crises where you hear about people offering stupid money, but actually the market needs to be more secure and more sort of robust in this conversation. Jay, uh, what's your advice on this sort of topic of 
and going into crazy deals and what's the outcome of that sort of situation from your experience? I think there's a big difference between buying something on the second-hand market and buying something where you're starting from scratch and it's got to be built. I think bargain hunting is all well and good in the second-hand market because you've got a deal that's going to be over and done with within a matter of weeks. You know exactly what you're buying. You see it there in front of you. You get it surveyed. You negotiate a price and you come away and you can boast about how good a deal you've got. You know exactly what you're going to get. But when you sign up for construction of a yacht, you're buying into a long-term relationship before you've got anything to show for your money. Two years, three years, five years in some cases. And I just think it's a false economy to think that you've won anything, scored any points at all, at the moment you sign the contract because the ship if, if your price is too low the ship no, shipyard may not be there throughout construction yeah. even if they manage to stay afloat they're not going to be terribly motivated to build a yacht on which they're losing money from day one and then what i've seen in a few cases over the years is that those buyers who go in at very low prices and end up having to terminate the contract and take possession of the yacht and complete it themselves, that's when it comes back to bite them because they end up paying the real cost of what the yacht should have been and more because they're taking it somewhere else for completion. So they end up paying the real price in any event. I just think, you know, of course it, it can work. You get the right shipyard that will build it even though they're losing, build the yacht correctly even though they're losing money. But I think on the whole, it's, it's just a bad formula, a bad way to go into a contract. Yeah, no, agreed. Um, I think one of the questions that has come up and I had on my list as well was the impact of the economic um, crisis that will come out of the COVID situation. What impact do you think that will have on the next six months to a year? In terms of, I was, I was sort of sort out this situation from a financial perspective um, on a global scale. What are your perspectives on that? Mark, well, I, I mean, gosh, that is it's so hard to tell, isn't it? Because the, um, I mean, I suppose like all these things, they're going to be winners and losers. I, I mean, aviation is obviously a big loser, but I, there aren't that many uh, pro, you know, privately held uh, airline companies. So I guess the losers in aviation are going to be the shareholders who are the likes of yours and my pensions. Um, but the, uh, it, you know, I really can't begin to answer that. I, I do think that the fallout will not be anything like as bad as it was in the financial crisis in 2008, where there was a significant loss of, uh, of, of money right across the board. And there was also the, the impact of people, you know, really not wanting to be seen to be... Uh, buying large expensive um toys like yachts uh, yeah. i i think i don't know i i think the I, when all this is over and done with i'm not sh convinced that in our industry and i kind of slightly hate saying this I'm, I'm just not sure that it will be that badly affected i do think the world's rich will come back and want to enjoy what they do i fear the losers in this crisis are going to be more like the small the small companies, the small people, the, the, the restaurants, the shops, and the hairdressers, um, you know, who have, once you're closed for two or three months uh, and you're still paying your rent, uh, there's an irreparable damage to your, uh, to, to your business. And I fear those are going to be the guys who will, mm -hmm. who will suffer the worst. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Fabi, any comment on that? Or are you expecting positives as yeah, well? Well, I don't want to sound extremely positive, but I think that uh, uh, generally the carpe diem element will be more important. You know, I think that once this uh, time is over, when this crisis is over, uh, um, we all uh, uh, we will all feel uh, ready to enjoy the life, and you know by booking a trip with your family to all the way to buying uh, buying a new boat obviously some of our clients uh, will be impacted but this is uh, i agree with mark this is only for some specific uh, sectors uh, we should not forget that uh, for the time being and i hope it will not be worse but uh, uh, we are we are having a two or three months slowdown or stop in some cases in the economy so this does uh, can 
for small business can be dramatic, but for very large company, very solid business, it's just, uh, it's just a slowdown. So um, I expect uh, uh, that, uh, I agree with Mark, I agree with Mark vision. I think uh, uh, some people will be affected, but the majority of our client will continue to dream about uh, their holiday, building a boat and, and whatever is uh, uh, related to the super yacht life. Yeah, I mean, from our uh, from the owners of the yachts that we're building at the moment, I have seen no indication of anybody uh, wanting to pull out, change, delay, postpone. Yeah, you know, nothing whatsoever. And we're actually just embarking on sea trials today um, for for a yacht, and and all and we're having is conversations with the owner about uh, you know getting delivery of the boat and moving it to wherever he wants it located, and so on. He's not wanting to hand the thing back, that's for sure. Yeah. I, I can confirm what the Mark says, even in our experience. Uh, we, we didn't experience any of our clients uh, thinking about uh, uh, stopping or, uh, or uh, rejecting the boat or whatever. Actually, their concern is the opposite. Some of them, they are concerned if the shipyard will come out of this uh, in a way that they will be able to complete their boat. I mean, from right, my okay. perspective, you've got to think about the industry that we're in. We're, we're in an industry of selling things that people don't need. And you can look on the, the, the negative side of that and say, well, how can I possibly convince somebody to buy a yacht? Um, he gets out of bed on one side of the bed and he wants one, and the next morning he's out of bed on the other side and he doesn't want it anymore. Or you can look on the positive side and you can say that the people who like yachting today, who are interested in ordering a yacht, are just as likely to be interested in ordering one when this crisis is over. And indeed, my own experience suggests that they're not waiting for that, but they're carrying on with negotiations. They're carrying on their discussions with shipyards. Just a matter of time before production can restart as normal. If you go back to the 2008, 2009, crisis, what did you see then? Um, you saw some owners who pulled back, and I think that affected the smaller end of the market more than the bigger one. The, the, the smaller end, I suppose, people were ordering yachts because they had um, a lot of extra cash that they weren't used to having it was a bonus for them, let's spend it on something nice. And as soon as that bonus disappears, that market, the bottom falls out of that market. But the larger end of the market, which is where the three of us mostly work, you had people who um, very much still wanted to order, but felt that they couldn't place an order while they were laying off their staff. Um, you had other people who pulled back for economic reasons in this crisis, so I can't really justify going ahead. But you had other people who said, look, I've got cash, plenty of it, nothing to invest in it. Everything is going down and into the red. And if I'm going to watch my investments go down and into the red, I might as well do it on the aft deck of a yacht. Um, and so there were people who saw it as an escape from the situation. I can see that happening again, you know, Fabio's Carpe Diem um, yeah. point, you know, so long as people don't think, well, I can't ever leave my house again, I'd better just spend the money on the house or, heaven forbid, build a bunker underneath it. Um, but so long as people have an expectation that life will get back to normal, as I'm sure it will, the people are yes. going to want yachts just as they always have. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I agree. I agree. <clears throat> Good. Um, Jay, can we just talk about force majeure briefly? I think it's a, it's a key part of the conversation that I think a lot of owners or lawyers especially have been sort of uh, exposed to this at the moment. Uh, what are your opinions and recommendations on this application of force majeure? How best to handle the situation? Well, I mean, for a, a legal point of view, it's, it, it's really very simple. I mean, you, you couldn't have a better example of a force majeure event because 
um, in all the cases that we're talking about, you, you've got a combination of uh, an epidemic or a pandemic, that's an obvious force majeure event in itself, and that goes in combination with government decrees and directives on closing down, staying at home. That's also a force majeure event in itself. There's really no question at all about this being a force majeure event. Where it gets more complicated from a legal point of view is just what the consequences of it are. Uh, and I've seen some shipyards taking the position that whenever the situation began, and not so easy to say when it actually began, um, but from that moment, it's force majeure, it's permissible delay until it ends. Well, once again, it's not so easy to say when it ends. I think the correct legal analysis is that you've, you've got an event which qualifies as force majeure, but then to get a permissible delay out of it as a shipyard, you need to be able to show exactly what effect it has had on production at the shipyard, on the completion and delivery of the yacht, putting aside any other causes of delay that might have been happening at the same time. But that's quite a difficult thing. Nobody can do it now. Nobody can say now just how much delay has been caused by any of these events. Um, even when the situation comes to an end, whenever that is, what what would constitute the thing coming to an end? Would it be a cure for COVID-19 or um, an announcement uh, that it's no longer affecting anybody? Um, all government decrees come to an end and you can go about work as normal. Let's say that's the end of it. Even at that point, you can't necessarily say how much delay has been caused because every single delay by every single supplier is going to have an effect on production. And really, you can't judge how much delay there has been until you get to the point of delivery where you can say, okay, I'm a month late, I'm two months late. What were all the causes of that month or two months of delay? And you look back and then you can analyze all of the causes and say how much delay was caused by force majeure. In concept, it's not so complicated, but factually it becomes very, very complicated trying to show how much delay has been caused. Um, I think all you can do at the moment is accept that these events are happening, accept on both sides, shipyard and owner, that they're likely to have an effect on the construction program and be prepared to say, okay, we'll stand back, we'll, we'll, we'll reserve our positions and let's take a look at it at the end. And one of the beauties of that is if you get to the time of delivery and you're only a month late, you've only got to argue about a month. You don't have to argue about the possibility of three months or six months to wait. So that's another reason why it makes sense to wait until the end before having the discussion. But in, um, I mean, I work for a lot of shipyards and, and where I'm not acting for the shipyard, I act for a lot of owners as well. And I've seen a real mixed bag of responses. Sometimes you send, uh, uh, on, on behalf of a shipyard, you send a force majeure notice. Uh, you get a very hostile reaction from the buyer. That how could this be happening to me? Of course, it can't be force majeure. Um, it might be an Italian shipyard or a French shipyard, but I've seen shipyards in the Netherlands working full time, so you can't possibly be suffering a force majeure delay. And then from other owners, you see a very sympathetic reaction. Um, and I think owners do have to be sympathetic because this is, this is happening so much in the public eye that if you were ever to end up in a dispute in an arbitration tribunal about delays flowing from these events, shipyards are going to start with an enormous amount of sympathy. Of course, yeah. they're going to have to prove the amount of delay that has been caused. It's going to 
vary from shipyard to shipyard because of all of the complicated supply chains. But uh, an owner who went into an arbitration about this force majeure event saying, I refuse to accept that it could apply to me is, is going to be on the back foot from day one. So I think you have to be sympathetic and, and, and willing to cooperate with the shipyard to see this through. Mark, how sympathetic are your owners? All of them. We're very lucky. Um, all of them have been sympathetic to the uh, to the situation, um, and they understand, uh, you know, that that it's it's difficult for us. Uh, so we're lucky on that front. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to continue. But I mean, as Jay says, it's the, the, what will trip us up, if anything, will be the supply chain, the the availability of materials. But it's the same in all walks of life, isn't it? If you start trying to build a house at the moment, you'll find that all the builder's merchants are shut and you can have the builder there, but he hasn't got any bricks or wood. Um, so far, it's, as I say, it's okay, but I mean, it's, it's that what, what will um, cause us problems, if anything. Yeah. Fabio, any comment? Well, yeah, clients? our clients generally, uh, you know, they've been uh, uh, very sympathetic with the shipyard. I think the situation is so obvious uh, that we are in a force majeure that uh, um, so it's, that that's not the real uh, the point uh, of, of our client. Uh, I agree with Jay that uh, the best way uh, to move forward with this is to collaborate with the shipyard. We should not forget that the shipyard interest is to uh, interest is to deliver the boat. Uh, so uh, um, there is no point, I think, in this stage uh, to force the shipyard for. Uh, a delivery date and uh, trying to make a commitment uh, immediately. I think it's the best uh, approach, and this is very much depending also on the owner's representative, is to collaborate with the shipyard, but make sure that the shipyard is acting on reasonable uh, terms. Uh, uh, because, at least from our side, the only worry is uh, that there may be, I don't say they are, but there may be shipyards trying to speculate on this. Uh, and this is what can upset or can be a matter of concern for uh, some of our clients that uh, uh, that actually shipyards are uh, going extending their permissible delay, leveraging on this force majeure double that they should do. Uh, but um, I mean, other than that, uh, I think that uh, the most of our clients understand the situation. Uh, what what I think is not nice for a client is the uncertainty. So some of them, they have at the moment no idea if their boat uh, that was supposed to be delivered in June will be delivered in July or in September or next year. And uh, I understand this is, this is difficult, but um, we are now entering the stage where shipyard can sit down with supplier, can sit down with subcontractors, with the owner's representative, and, and all together trying to, to bring this uh, forward in, in the most efficient way. Yeah, I think as things start to unlock, we can now get around the table almost and, and plan out what that um, causation is and more important, the timeline will look like. Because, uh, and then that falls into the whole process of what the owner's representatives or the brokers can do is that's add the communication and that negotiation process to be much more collaborative. Um, Derek made an interesting comment earlier on saying that the relationship with the shipyard should be a long one, way beyond the delivery period. So I think that's another key part of this whole process you don't want fighting in a negotiation process under force majeure because you end up with a negative end game of the whole delivery phase i think that that's one of the problems you can easily develop as part of a uh, an aggressive stance so being positive and being collaborative has to be the uh, the best advice to take forward um jay from your perspective um what experience have you had at all any cases you had in the past where force majeure has been applied and how you've come out of it. Any other episodes in the past? Um, yes. Um, fortunately, it. fortunately, it's it's quite a rare occurrence. We spend a lot of time arguing about it in um, in contract negotiations, but it comes about very rarely. I do remember a very entertaining negotiation I had with um, with somebody from India on the other side, and we we started talking about the force majeure clause and all of the examples of it, and we got to 
expected to have a lot of discussion about strikes and that kind of thing. We got to the very first item on the list, which was act of God. And he said, no, it must be act of gods. In the plural, and I had to agree that one, it was a very good point. Um, but examples in the past are few and far between. Um, there was a case in Northern Europe a couple of years ago that affected a number of shipyards, affected a number of shipyards, that, and that was where um, a particular supplier of, of um, grit, the shot blasting hulls, uh, had managed to get some, con they, they supplied some contaminated grit. It was contaminated with asbestos to a number of shipyards. And of course that, because it was asbestos, that meant a very complicated and time consuming process of cleaning everything. Um, and a number of shipyards lost a couple of weeks, several weeks of production because of that. But I mean, what can you do about it? Mostly when you get a force majeure situation, you just have to let it play itself out. There is nothing you can do, no amount of money that you can spend to solve the problem more quickly than it's going to be solved. Um, one of the lessons that I've seen over the years, I remember, this is going back a very long time, with some commercial ships that were clients had on order from shipyards in, in Croatia during the civil war there. And of course, war is the fourth major event. But there was no way of bringing those contracts to an end. You just had to wait years until the war was over before production could resume again. So I think you need to think about some kind of way of bringing a contract to an end. And it's in the interest really of both shipyard and owner to be able to do that because otherwise you're left in limbo potentially for years. But in most cases, it's, it, it, it's what it says on the tin. It's an event beyond everybody's control. You can't resolve it any more quickly than it's going to be resolved. And you just have to wait until it sorts itself out. Yeah. As a comment from David saying, has the pandemic highlighted the importance of force majeure being reciprocal? Now, sure, it's reciprocal anyway, isn't it? It's not, actually, and there's a good reason for okay. that. Um, and if, you, if you think about the balance of obligations under a construction contract, really all the obligations are on the builder's side. Builder has to build the art. Um, the owner's obligations are quite limited. There may be some design ones. Yeah. Um, there's obviously a payment one, which is very important. The other things that look a bit like obligations are often not obligations at all. They're things like supervising construction, attending sea trials, that kind of thing. They're not really obligations. The, sh the owner isn't obliged to do those things. He does them in his own interest. And under most contracts, if the buyer doesn't show up for the sea trials or doesn't show up to inspect the yacht during construction, everything simply carries on and there's a mechanism that allows the builder to complete and deliver the op, notwithstanding. Yeah, but David's, David's comment is that should it be reciprocal in those situations you've just highlighted, attending trials, signing off, etc., etc., because what happens if the only can't turn up and attend the trials or sign off milestones? I think you've got to look at it in a, from a practical point of view. I mean, let's, let's start with the thing that is a real obligation and the most important one that a buyer has, payment. A payment should never be affected by force majeure. The buyer's either got the money or he hasn't. And there may be some difficulty right. in making payment, but essentially he's either got the money or he hasn't. But what would be the consequence if somehow a buyer couldn't pay because of force majeure? What happens then? Is the buyer entitled to claim force majeure, but what, the builder has to go on building the yacht without the buyer's money, using his own money? I mean, that doesn't make sense. It's, it's an illogical outcome. Um, or let's say a buyer not able to make design decisions or attend C trials. Um, 
the consequence of that is is what that there is um, a permissible delay that construction is delayed but the the buyer the builder is also getting the benefit of that you can't have a force majeure provision that applies only to the buyer without the builder also getting the same benefit because otherwise you've got the builder supposedly building the yacht without the buyer's money without the buyer's design input what do you do i think that's why you don't have force majeure provisions that apply on the buyer's side mm. mark does this change the way that he should look at contracts or negotiations of the climate what do you mean the coronavirus situation where we're in now with regard to uh, to force majeure issues no it doesn't yes. change at all no i mean as jay says you know these things are are extremely rare i think in all my career i've really only been involved in uh, in two or three force majeure um, issues uh, but it's very important as jay you know fully correctly points out and i think the clauses that are in the contracts at the moment in my opinion are pretty fair and equitable i mean they reflect what the reality of life is if you're hit with a force majeure event there ain't much you can do about it so there has to be a provision yeah yeah but in terms of so we do our best to work through them of course and you do your best to mitigate the effects afterwards where possible but you know, you've yeah. got a fixed date delivery contract and once you've lost a you know four or eight weeks of build time it's it's really really tough to catch that kind of thing up again yeah yeah uh, i'm going to change subject very briefly uh, i'm going back to your point about supply chain and subcontractors mark um do you have any insight as to what could be in short supply going forward <laughs> what what problems you're having unfortunately you're talking to the commercial director oh, no, I realize that. rather than the production director so or even the finance director he's probably got a much better idea of uh, what's yeah, sure, sure. the corner than i have i can't answer you know we're, we're again I mean, without wishing to sound but blow our own trumpet, we're we're quite lucky as a shipyard because we have, you know, a huge chunk of the production of the yachts is managed under under our own uh, roof, uh, from the from construction through to uh, interior construction, um, and all of those disciplines. So um, compared to many shipyards, we have a, a a smaller supply chain than others. But you know, good old raw materials are still critical. If you don't raw materials then everything stops um yeah marble from from fabio's country uh is, is must be quite questionable at the moment with uh marble factories being shut down i'm sure there's some delays there uh, but i can't be specific now on on uh, on other shortages to here what makes you certain the business goes back to normal while most other businesses are going to face a new reality what may i have no certainty at all that everything will go back to normal is my personal opinion that i was asked for um uh, i i think i what i can't answer is how long this will go on for and how long the recovery process will be after uh, uh after we're allowed to start moving and life starts to going back to some kind of normality but as i said before i mean i think the people are sadly who are going to suffer the worst out of this are the the hoteliers the restaurants the hairdressers um the aviation industry um uh, those are the ones who are being uh being badly affected at the moment have you any thoughts well uh, <clears throat> my thoughts is similar to mark thoughts this will be over for sure uh the timing is uh, is what we cannot predict and uh, longer uh, will be the time will be out of it uh, then more business will be affected but uh, uh, I think that uh, in general, um, you know, the, once this will be over, I, I feel that uh, the, any business, and especially our business, will be very quickly back again with uh, with a uh, great uh, enthusiasm. Um, the yeah, the, the only thing, if I look more specifically at our uh, at our business, I think that uh, uh, what we learned uh, and what the client will probably uh, look in a different way is. Uh, is the balance of the element when you talk about the new build? I mean, you know, when you discuss with the client and, and you and you investigate for many months a new build, 
you look at different elements. It's not only price, but it's the quality, it's the scope of supply, it's the branding, it's the terms, conditions, um, and, and, and financial solidity of the shipyards. And I think that after this experience, uh, all these elements will be looked uh, by our clients uh, with a different uh, priority. You know? So probably, just to make a, a, an example, probably, yeah, obviously price will still be a priority, but uh, will be less of a priority and the client will, will opt uh, more for shipyards uh, which are solid, uh, very organized, because in case of a similar situation, a strong, very organized, solid shipyard with a long uh, order book uh, can uh, help the client come out of this uh, with much more comfort than, uh, than a smaller shipyard that can offer a better price, but, uh, you know, that will extremely suffer out of this uh, situation. That's what I expect, and that's what I already feel by talking with clients. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think there's a couple of questions coming about sort of stage payments and supply chain failure. Uh, any thoughts on that, Jay, in terms of, if a stage payment's linked to a, a specific date of a, um, a subcontractor, how do you handle that? Well, usually they're linked to stages of construction so that the builder has to join the hull and superstructure together, for example, or put the main engines on board in order to trigger a payment. Uh, if you've got force majeure happening, you're unable to get the engines delivered or you haven't got the workers who can weld the hull and superstructure together, you don't achieve, achieve the stage and therefore you can't ask for payment. It's really as simple as that. Um, and it's a problem for yeah. the shipyard because it, it, it's unable to get paid and its yeah. cash flow is is affected so i think that's what's going to be a big problem for a lot of shipyards um force majeure a force majeure claim doesn't solve all of its problems so fabio what, what's your case? advice fabio to a client in that situation would you say keep paying <laughs> <laughs> well uh first of all uh we have to look at the case by case you know and uh, there are shipyards that unfortunately uh, if they don't get a payment, they will not be able to continue the boat. So, uh, so that's that's a very extreme case. But uh, uh, as Jay said, the stage payment is a, if the contract has been very well written, let's say negotiated, the stage payment it's a it's a clear event. Uh, so uh, and it's up to the shipyards uh, if they have a delay and they have, and they have no subcontractor to complete that stage payment. As an owner representative, we can only witness that uh, the stage payment uh, uh, has not been reached. Um, then I have to say that uh, in our experience, you also need to be careful because uh, in the beginning of this uh, pandemic situation, we have, we have unfortunately seen, not directly, but indirectly, situation where, uh, you know, uh, uh, just three days before the closing, the lock, lockdown in Italy, uh, there was an attempt to claim a stage payment reached, which obviously was not reached. So um, I, I would I would look more at the specific case. But generally speaking, uh, uh, any client has been um, uh, as clear in his mind that uh, the shipyards needs to, to receive payments to continue with the boat. I will tell you, in our experience, something that happened at the, uh, even in in the opposite way. I mean, the, a client agreed with the shipyard to anticipate some payments. Because uh, he felt uh, and he understood that the shipyard was uh, uh, suffering financially, and obviously he understood the risk that uh, you know that uh, he, he was get he was getting. So he, he was happy to agree different stage payment in his disadvantage in order to have the shipyard progressing with the construction. Mm. Okay, okay. Yeah. I mean, I think I'd go back to the point that I made earlier that yacht construction has got to be a collaboration. Got yeah. to, you've got to maintain a relationship. Um, and that's, so to advise, a, a, a buyer is perfectly within his rights not to pay if the stage hasn't been completed. But if you're in a complex force majeure situation, um, 
for a buyer simply to fall back on his contractual rights and say, until I see the milestone certificate, I'm not going to pay. Is short-sighted. I'm not talking about altruism in looking after the shipyard. I'm talking about um, recognizing what your own interests are. A shipyard that goes bust because its cash flow has been ruined is not going to leave the owner in a good position. As a buyer, halfway through a, a construction, it's it's um, it's a it, it's a little bit like being pregnant. There is only a limited number of things you can do, um, and really, you've you've got to find some way to see it through, some way to take delivery of, even if you know you're going to end up terminating the contract. Mostly, you need to find some way to get delivery of the yacht in order to realize any value out of the investment that you've made. And that's why I think buyers need to be prepared to be constructive in situations like this, not just to fall back on aggressive legal rights. So is this part of the, the positive outcome of the crisis that we actually have to be smarter in our due diligence process and, and actually the advice we're getting has to be more robust? I, mean, I don't think anything has changed in that respect. This has always been the truth and, and uh, sensible buyers and sensible shipyards have worked out ways of cooperating with each other. Um, and they tend to be the parties that have a happy experience yeah. of it. Um, so, Fabio, what role does the broker play in all this? Well, I think that, uh, first of all, um, I, a lot of clients are now realizing in this difficult time that having a, a good advisor would have made a difference. Uh, we are personally experiencing uh, some uh, um, projects starting now for us, which are already going on, where the client is in need of uh, support because he finds himself in a difficult situation related to this force majeure and, uh, and, 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 and pandemic. And then, uh, um, without going into the specific case, I think the, the client's feeling um, is that uh, he, he needs professional advice and probably needed before professional advice. Uh, generally, I think that this will only emphasize the difference between uh, uh, very good, experienced and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and professional uh, advice or consultants that can be a blogger, can be a technical surveyor or the, 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 a team of the two or, or a larger team uh, versus a very light advice that uh, sometimes uh, uh, looks uh, cheaper to the client, but uh, that uh, he will pay 10 times uh, back in case of uh, any minimal problem. And I'm not talking about only uh, a force majeure uh, situation. So I think uh, this feeling will be, will be stronger. And I hope, and that's, I think, um, something that many of us are trying to pass, communicate with the owner, is that the, 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 the put yourself, when you talk about the new build, a very strong team of, of advisors from, from New Year, from technical surveyor, uh, a commercial advisor, uh, because the, the investment in those kind of people, it's uh, almost irrelevant compared to the, to the, to the investment of, of buying a boat, but it's of a, a, a huge uh, added value to the, to, the, to the entire process. And the situation we are in now, with this force majeure, challenging fighting shipyards opening and closing it's a clear demonstration of it yeah yeah Mark, quick question for you um one of the things that came up in the pre the pre-con was more about do you think the business model will change at all as a result of the crisis do you think it will change the way they negotiate deals or the sales process will change <clears throat> well i expect people will look at the force majeure clauses <laughs> in a bit more detail maybe <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, it's a very long uh, uh, process that we've gone through. It's been tested over many years that, that long predate this event and previous events of its of its type. You know, shipbuilding contracts have probably well, Jay's better to answer this one than I am. Have probably haven't changed a great deal in their 
format over a long, long period of time. Um, no, I, honestly, I don't. I think like all these things, you know, we, we, we will survive, we will recover, we will come through, and people's desires will remain relatively unchanged. They will still want to go yachting. They will still want to cruise in the south of France. So uh, I, I can't really see that, that it, in the future that it will change much. What will happen for 2020, heaven knows, probably tricky, probably really difficult. The summer season is probably not going to be a great yeah, but one. In terms of fear. what clients may think about pre the crisis, now after the crisis, do you think they'll change the way they use their boats or the way they actually design their living spaces, their operational spaces, even their crew and guests interaction? Do you think that may change the way they think about the operation from a build perspective? Yeah, it, 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 it could do. I mean, yeah, I, I think what you're alluding to maybe is, you know, will, will boats be set up to allow what? More, uh, no, distancing not. I mean, maybe you'll start to see uh, in much bigger yachts a, more of an interest in medical yeah. facilities on board. Maybe it'll focus more people on a need for better medical um, uh, arrangements on yachts. But I don't think that... Uh, layout and configuration, crew areas and all the rest of it will change much. There's always a battle between how much space the crew are allowed to have and how much the yeah. element needs to have. Uh, I, 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 no, I don't, see, I, don't, I don't honestly think that there'll be many, many changes. Have you, have you had regard. any conversations about this yet? Well, we are talking actually uh, with clients uh, for new build projects and some of them we are in the selecting the design, so in the design stage. But to be honest with you, no one of our clients is even mentioning about designing the boat differently because of the coronavirus. Uh, and that can be, can happen again uh, in the future. And Mark said on large yachts, maybe, maybe medical facilities, but uh, on an average, um, I think that... Uh, uh, the, 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 the idea and the dream about uh, building a boat and being around the world is very far away from, uh, from uh, using the boat uh, as a, an, an emergency escape in a, in a pandemic uh, situation. I think it's the, probably the last thing you want to do is being confined on board with, uh, with your crew uh, in, and not being able to cruise around. So, no, we are not. Uh, we are not. We are not seeing and noticing any difference in uh, yacht uh, design. Good, good. All right. Um, there's a question we had on on text beforehand, which was really, I think, Mark and Fabi can probably answer this. Is do you think the ex the, the number of speculation projects in the market will dec decline or increase as a result of this crisis? Will it decline or increase the number of spec? build yachts in the market will it decline or increase mm, i don't know maybe may, maybe there would be if anything a slight decline i think i don't can't see any reason why there'd be an increase i think yeah. that's probably unlikely uh, maybe there'll be a slight decline maybe some shipyards will be uh more cautious or maybe be forced to uh reduce um, speculative production that could happen but again i think it'll only be a brief dip i think after a couple of years you'll see things go back w. again i think they will decline uh, not dramatically but they will decline um, simply because uh, uh, some shipyards uh, will not be the will not have the financial need to to start the yeah. under construction i mean we have to think that there are uh, shipyards like uh, heason uh, which uh, they have a very solid, very strong business model, and they have uh, always a very few projects, several projects under construction. But there are also shipyards where they have three boats under construction, and one of the three is on speculation, and they are really uh, uh, gambling uh, in a positive way on, on on needs. Those shipyards will will not start any other uh, any other uh, on spec uh, uh, construction. So I think we, it will uh, it will decline, not dramatically, but uh, yeah. It will. Jay, any opinion on this? Well, I think you look back at the, at the financial crisis of 2009 and what you saw after that was a couple of years of consolidation, shipyards who uh, couldn't continue and yeah. dropped out. And then you had new shipyards coming back into the market again. So it lasted, it was a couple of years of effect. And um, 
then we're more or less back to what we had before. So I should think that the consequences will be the same this time around. Okay, good, good, good. All right, before we, before we wrap up, um, I've asked you all to give the audience ind independently so a valuable piece of advice regarding the new build market uh, after everything's subsided. Um, what have you learned and what advice would you give to owners, owners' reps, or people looking to build a yacht in the next year to 18 months? Just one piece of advice. Jay, start with the lawyers. Well, I'm going to bang on about something that I've mentioned a couple of times already, and that is recognize that you're in for the long haul with a shipyard. You're not just buying something that's there and you sail it away. You're committing to a two, three, even longer relationship with somebody, and you need to make that relationship work. Um, nothing is won or lost at the time you sign the contract, um, or if anything is won, it's trust and understanding between the parties that will see them through the difficulties that will inevitably occur during the course of construction. And if they've had a good dress rehearsal during the contract negotiations, when the real thing happens, they'll remember their lines and they'll know how to behave. Thank you, Jay. Uh, Mark? Well, of course, I'm not biased in this, but I mean, I would just recommend sticking with a good, solid Northern <laughs> European shipyard. How predictable. <laughs> <laughs> and and Fabio, please, final, final advice to the market, please. Um, well, I would say my advice, my main advice to all uh, our clients is uh, before you start uh, uh, considering our uh, new build project, put together a solid, experienced and honest and professional team around you, uh, advisor, technical advisor, a good lawyer like Jay Tucker, that can uh, eventually suggest you to build uh, the best boat at uh, Northern European shipyard located in Oz. So, <laughs> very good advice. That. That's, that's, that's terrible, terribly biased advice, but I like it. <laughs> I can tell you all your well. faces off so I can just say a farewell to everyone. Thank you very much indeed, panel, for your. Uh, Invite your involvement and your candor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.